Good morning, friends. Welcome to Ridgepoint Church. It is a great morning to celebrate and worship our God together. Will you stand? We're going to give him our full attention and our praises as we begin together.
Uh, good morning. I don't know if you walked in today, and when you got out of bed and came here, you felt like the sky was blue and the grass was green and all was right with the world, or you just woke up with a little bit of heaviness. Um, you know this is true, right? None of us escapes hard days. And more than that, none of us escapes hard seasons. I mean, some hardship, it's here today and gone tomorrow. But some hardship just hangs around. Um, this has been a hard season for our nation, like the last year and a half with COVID and all the political partisanship and all the mass mandates and the school board decisions and everyone's anxious and irritable and it's just a hard season. I've noticed uh, here in the last weeks, just I've heard in conversations with our church family that there seems to be a, a heaviness. And so I felt compelled this last week to say, hey, I just want to stand up in front of our great church and just say, okay, if you're among those of us who carry some heaviness this morning, like maybe it is over the COVID or the severe or it's family drama or it's grief or it's loneliness or it's depression or it's what, but you're in a season of hardship. Like, and it, it doesn't look like you're gonna step out of it tomorrow, right? I just wanna say, can I try to encourage you a bit? So last week, I talked about the importance of speaking declarations of truth to help us step out of the long, dark shadow, right? And again, you might be here. Sky is blue, grass is green. It's only 80-some degrees today, so it's a beautiful day and all is right with the world. But if you're among those of us who just carry heaviness and heartache and loneliness or family drama and it's weighty, I just want to remind you to keep declaring truth. There's a, there's a great truth uh, declaration in Psalm 27 uh, where King David says, I am certain of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. <laughs> okay, Psalm 27, 13. And his declaration, I'm certain of this. Like in the middle of his discouragement, he declared what he knew to be true. I am certain of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And the land of the living is kind of a poetic way of saying, okay, right now I'm in the land of the dead. My world is gray. There's no color. I'm heavy. But there is a land of the living. And that may come tomorrow or next week, or next month, or heaven someday, but I'm certain of this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in that land. And then the, the next uh, line, verse 14, it says, so wait on the Lord. Be strong, take heart, and wait on the Lord. Uh, now, I don't know who likes to wait. I don't know, and if, if any of you like to stand in a long line, let me know, and when you get at the front, I'll just cut in with you. Uh, but no one likes standing in a long line. And if you're standing in a long line at some amusement park, and you're there for an hour, and you finally get on the roller coaster, and it's a dud, that long line was a waste of your one and only life. <laughs> If you're in a long line at a new restaurant you've never been in, you wait 30, 45 minutes, and then the meal, is, it tanks and the service is worse, like you wasted your wait. But if you know what's at the front of the line, ah, that doesn't make the cancer go away. It doesn't overnight blow away your depression. It doesn't automatically fix your family drama, but if you know that the goodness of the Lord is at the front of that line, you can keep waiting. And so wherever you're at, and again, part of this for me, uh, I don't think I'm discouraged, but I've just carried a heaviness the last month because a good friend of mine, Dennis Turner, who's founding pastor of a great church out east here in Wichita, Christ Church, 
He's been there 25, 30 years. He's a tremendous pastor to the city and uh, a good friend, and he's been battling COVID for a month, and he died yesterday. And his family is entering a season of hardship in his church. We all got family drama or marriage drama and discouragement. I'm just seeing this uptick in our church. I'm saying, can we just declare truth and say, in the middle of my gray, dark land of the dead, (laughs) I declare this to be true. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, so I'll wait in line. It doesn't fix everything, but it helps you get through because you know that what's at the front of the line is worth the wait. So hang in there, hang in there, and keep declaring truth. You will see the goodness of the Lord. Father, I want to pray over our church family. Again, there's a bunch of people that came in and all was right with the world, but I know there's a bunch of people struggling in marriages and discouragement and fear and anxiety and depression and um, they're fighting stuff left and right and it's a hard season. It's not just a hard day, but it's a season and it doesn't look like they're gonna step out of it tomorrow. So I pray over our church, I pray for our church. I pray that you would uh, Remind us to keep standing on what we know is true. We declare the truth that we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and help us to wait and be strong and take heart and not give up because we will see the goodness of the Lord and our wait will not have been wasted. So encourage us, Father. Give us perseverance. The world needs people of hope and help us to be those people in a very hopeless world. So we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide the ransom for my life oh he is my soul you are good and good oh you are good and good oh you are Never gonna let me down. 
never gonna let, never gonna let me die.
the visible and the invisible. Every seat of power, realm of government, principality and authority, it all exists through him and for his purpose. He is before all things and by him all things hold together. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So we join the angels around the throne of God, worshiping this Jesus, and we sing, oh, praise the name. thank you today in spite of all of our troubles and we don't know who's here who's struggling who's facing a season of of trouble where it just seems never-ending but Lord every one of us here in this room and 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 watching online we all have you we have you to look forward to our joy is in you and father in spite of the trouble and the difficulties. We know there are better days ahead. And Father, we thank you for that. Without you, we would not have that hope. Today, I want to pray for anybody who's struggling, that, that they will be reminded today that you are there. You're still there, right there for them. And as Joe comes to, to speak, we want to pray for his words, that they, they reach hearing ears and soft hearts, that everyone is pointed back to you. They see you through all of this. Father, we thank you. In your son's name, amen. Well, good morning, good morning. It's good to see you all on this Labor Day weekend. Thanks for being here. If you're in the room here on campus or, on, or you're online, thanks for making us part of your weekend and worshiping with us. Let me share just a couple things before we get started with the message this morning. First, if you're a guest with us and you think it's now time to connect with Ridgepoint and to find out more about us, we encourage you to take out your phones and text the word Ridge to the number 97000. And when you do so, it'll start a conversation with us and with you so that you can hear more about Ridgepoint. It's kind of like our own personal Siri here at Ridgepoint, so we encourage you to do that so that you can begin to connect with us and we with you. The second thing is that this is football season. It's also nomination season, so this is a chance for us to add new leaders to our volunteer teams that help govern the church, and we're looking for one position this year on our faith and life team. And the Faith and Life team, if, you're, if that's kind of new to you, they are the team of people that give themselves to prayer and to care for the life of the church. There are times when they will weigh in on maybe if there's a conflict that happens or they'll weigh in on a piece of curriculum that we're considering for a ministry in the church. And so they have the spiritual gift of discernment. Like if you have a question about the Bible, the first person that comes to your mind, that's the person who's qualified for the Faith and Life team or the person that you reach out for who you want to pray for you. That's the person that we like to have on this team. So if you know a person like that, let me do, ask you to do a couple things. Number one, Go to that person first and ask them if they would like to be considered to be on the faith and life team. Nothing is more startling than get a phone call or an email that they are being considered in the nomination process. So ask them first. 
And if they say yes without much conjoling, then you can nominate their names. There's a couple ways that you can do that. There's some boxes scattered throughout campus or some in this room, some in the lobby area. You can put their name in there. You can also submit uh, online through an email. Just go to nominations at uh, richpointwichita.com and you can submit their names there. And then the nominating team will begin to pray over those names as we gather them in the next few weeks. And the last thing I want to share before we get to the message this morning is that family dinner hour is returning this Wednesday at 5.30. A meal prepared for us here at church. So if you'd like to join with your family, with the rest of the church family, it starts at 5.30. Dinner is $5 for adults, $2 for kids, and then kids under 2 are eat absolutely free. So we encourage you to come at 5.30. That'll go from 5.30 to 6.30. Then there's an array of programming and classes for people of all ages here at the church starting this week. Wednesday. Well, last week, Pastor Brent started us in a sermon conversation about writing your story, and uh, we're going to continue on in that conversation today. Let me start by telling you a story of a time when I signed up for something that I didn't really think through before I signed up. Okay, that's kind of my personality, so it happens a lot, but this one was more significant. Um, I had finished my first half marathon run um, late in my 20s, and I thought, the next thing you need to do after you do a half of a marathon is to run a full marathon. So I began to scour the internet for a more local full marathon that I could try on for size, because how... How challenging could it be? I mean, you just do the thing you've done before, just do it twice. And so I signed up for the Eisenhower Memorial Marathon in Abilene, Kansas, which uh, Pastor Brent has ran a couple of times before, and he calls it the church marathon because you can run it on Saturday, and if you're able to, you can come to church on Sunday afterwards. A lot of pastors run uh, the marathon there in Abilene. And so I signed up and I had a, a coworker and a friend who wanted to run with me, so I was thankful for that. We went out and got a training plan and it was brutal. I just remember at the end of every long run just craving Chinese food. <laughs> and so the Chinese restaurants really had like a, a burst in their economy during my training plan. I finished the training plan just in time and I need to tell you like the first 15 miles of the run were picture perfect. It was a great day, everything was feeling good. But then at mile 17, I entered into the phase of a marathon that uh, experienced runners call the wall. Anybody felt the wall before? Maybe just a couple of folks out there. I just remember feeling pain that I never felt before and wondering if I was, if this is it. Like this is, I was gonna like start to see the pearly gates after that. I remember Ginger, my wife, she came alongside the road at mile 17 and she's, she's trying to encourage me. She's like, how do you feel? And all I could get out in the midst of that pain was my legs. They feel like death. I mean, that's all I could say. That was all the, the wisdom that could come out of my mouth at that time. And I, I just knew I was in deep, deep trouble. I was in way over my head. I had nine more miles to go and I had no idea how I was going to get there. Uh, maybe you've been there before. You've been in over your head with something. Maybe not a marathon, but maybe you took on more responsibilities at work or you're in the middle of raising a family or uh, perhaps you're younger, you're a student, you're taking on a ton of responsibilities, job, extracurriculars, things like that, and you're like, wow, I just, I seem completely overwhelmed here. Uh, I don't know what I should do next. And we think that because we're experiencing these moments of challenge that perhaps we've done something wrong and we've made a mistake and that actually might be the case. But I think the challenge and the walls that we face during a critical process is actually mysteriously a critical piece of our story. It's where we were shaped and formed and uh, we grow because of it. Uh, last week, Pastor Brent started this conversation about writing our story and he introduced us to the first critical element of a story, which was a character with a problem. If you don't have a character with a problem, you don't have a story. And so he talked about how when we're writing our stories, W-R-I-T-I-N-G, that we're actually writing our stories, R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, because there's some things that are out of whack, there's glitches in the matrix, and we need to fix them in order to move forward, okay? So but as we try to do that, we find ourselves, like I was, on the trail of the marathon wondering, how can I get some extra help here in order for me to continue to move forward? Because writing our story at this critical point of the story is quite messy. This will actually usher us into the second critical piece of the story, which is whenever this happens, typically in a movie or a story, 
The main character with his problem or her problem meets a guide with a plan. And this happens in every single epic story. Here's just a few examples. Luke Skywalker meets Yoda. And uh, Rocky Balboa meets Mickey. And then later he has Apollo Creed, one of his former opponents, to be his guide. Even Nemo has Dory as a guide in the middle of his journey. And then who could forget Gandalf, who is a guide several times in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings sagas. It seems like at the moment when it seems like all is falling apart, a guide enters the story. In fact, if you want to ruin the next movie date night with your significant other, when the main character is having their problem, you can lean over and say, I bet you the guide comes up next. And you'll ruin every single movie that you get to watch. Now, I think that some of us, we say, well, I, I recognize that there's a guide, but not every character can be a guide, and that's true. A guide has a couple of critical pieces about who they are as a character in order to be presented as a suitable guide in the story. There's two critical traits, or, sorry, traits that Donald Miller, who's an author, he talks about. A guide has to have these two things in tandem. They have to have empathy for the character, and they have to have credibility in order to lead them. Think about it. If you or I want to be a guide and we're lacking one of these things, we're not a guide, okay? If I have all the empathy in the world for you, but I have no idea what you're trying to do, all I am is a cheerleader who's kind of annoying because I have no idea what I'm talking about, right? But if I have all credibility, if I have all the experience, but no empathy, then I resemble kind of like a drill sergeant who might be saying all the right things, but without the care and consideration and empathy, involved in that if I was going to try to be your guide in that way you would begin to miss my calls intentionally and begin to block my number because if I'm not warm in my interactions with you you're going to resist me to be a guide so these two things working in tandem allow a guy to help the character engage their problem now this is the way in which every plot of every film and every story that you and I care about, this is how they move the plot forward. But perhaps the the, the skeptic among us would ask this question. Well, that's good for movies. That's good for stories that we read. But does that happen in an everyday life? I mean, when can I expect Gandalf to just show up at my office one day? When am I going to encounter Yoda, you know, in, in the middle of the supermarket uh, when I'm sifting through my problems as they're scanning my groceries? Well, the answer to that question, the skeptical question, is how do you see the world? How do I see the world? If we see the world is full of scarcity, where um, the survival of the fittest, you have to move faster than everyone else in order to get your own, then there's a chance that you and I won't anticipate a guide. But as Christian believers, we believe the world is not rigged towards scarcity, but towards goodness and blessing because there's the one creator God that we meet in Jesus Christ in the midst of it. So if you and I can believe that, then you and I can believe and know that God is going to provide a guide along the way. This is the way that Isaiah the prophet says about God's goodness and God's guidance in the world. He says this in Isaiah 55, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so is my word that goes out of my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose of for which I sent it. So Isaiah says this, God is always speaking. God's voice and guidance is the base beat that's behind everything. But the lingering question is, are you and I going to be open to hear this guidance that God provides? And I think it's been in my experience, and perhaps it's yours, that this guidance filters down in different ways at depths of relationship in our life. I want to cover those very quickly one after another. The first one is that at times God's guidance comes to us in these really quick, brief, episodic nudges that we get from people. Most of the time they're complete strangers. It's that odd conversation with the person next to us on a flight. It's Uh, the strange interaction that we have with someone sitting next to us in the bleachers at our kids' soccer games. It's the conversation that somebody whips up with us in the middle of an aisle there at Dillon's or something like that. And for whatever reason, we didn't expect to hear any wisdom from that person, but in an uncanny way, God speaks to us 
through the words of a complete stranger. This happened in Acts chapter 18. There's a young person by the name of Apollos. He's a young leader in the church. His, his heart's on fire for God, and he's trying to preach in the streets. But he has this neat, brief interaction with a couple of leaders in the church that changes his life for good. The author of Acts says this, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Isn't that just a lovely way to say it? They had to straighten him out a little bit. When he arrived in Achaia, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. So, Apollos is preaching in Corinth and he has this invitation to go to Priscilla and Aquila's home. They have chips and salsa. They talk theology. All of a sudden, light bulbs start going off in Apollos' brain. The next time he preaches, he has way more fruit in his ministry than before. Apollos didn't have to embrace this interaction from Priscilla and Aquila. He could have turned down their invitation. He could have said, he could have said I don't know who you are. And what makes you think that you know this better than I do? But because he was curious and he was open and he trusted in God's provision, he embraced the invitation of complete strangers. And that little nudge changed his trajectory of his life and ministry forever. I think it'd be overwhelming for us to consider that these little nudges that we resist have been opportunities that we've missed to hear God's voice in our life. So one of the first things that we have to be open to is how God in his great goodness is filtering down this guidance through complete strangers in our life. And if we pay attention, we might just hear God's voice in the midst of their interactions. But the second layer, a little deeper layer, is the longer sustained relationships. I think when we think about guidance and guides, this is the thing that we think more of. We think of those who've been with us for quite a long time. It's the old football coach that we still call up on the phone. It's the first small group leader that showed us the way of Jesus, that we bounce questions from the Bible off still, or we ask them if they would pray for us because of this significant need in our lives. It's that algebra teacher, even though we got a a strong C in their class. We really resonated with them, and so we reach out to them through Facebook, and we ask them questions for their guidance from time to time. These are the gifts that God gives us, and we know that, they, that God has given this person to us, and so we keep them close. This is the way in which the church organized themselves. They stayed connection, in connection through community, and they traveled with one another for several years through the life of faith. The Apostle Paul articulates this opportunity for these types of guides in a strange passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. He's trying to communicate to this young Corinthian church who are quite inexperienced and and quite a mess actually in their church. He's trying to convey his love to them because for some reason, even though they embraced Paul beforehand, they were resisting him later in their journey. And so as he's reaching out to them, he says these words, even if you had... 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. Paul says, people are gonna move in and out of your life, in and out of the church, in and out of your faith life. But there are gonna be some people who remain, people who have a connection and a commitment to you like a dad has to a son or a mom has to their kids. Watch for these people. Stay close to these people. And if you ever have the gift of these people in your life, embrace them and mimic the way in which they follow Jesus because they will help you to deepen your walk with God in an array of subtle ways. So between nudges and these deeper relationships, the average believer, if we're open to it, has this constellation of guidance from God. But that leaves one question. How does all this work? How does a gentle nudge from a person at a bus stop in Barcelona, Spain, in this long sustained relationship that I've had with my pastor 30 years ago, how does all that work together in a puzzle together? That brings to the the very depth, the, the deepest relationship of God's guidance that we have is the presence of the Holy Spirit. In his last long discourse that Jesus had with his followers before he was apprehended and crucified, Jesus said, I'm gonna be taken from you and they were all sad because of that and obviously you and I would be as well. 
But in his attempt to comfort them, Jesus revealed this great truth in John chapter 14. He said, all of this I've spoken while still with you. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I've said to you. From the very beginning, Christians have said in a mystery, we've sensed God's presence with us in all phases of life. And from the very beginning, they said this is the presence of God the Holy Spirit. In one of the first creeds, before you wanted to become a Christian as an early believer in the early part of our story, you'd have to say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life. That was, that was mandatory to be considered to be a Christian. He's the one who walks beside us. He's the one who encourages us along the way. He's been there from the very beginning. In fact, believers have said, and the Apostle Paul said this in 1 Corinthians. He says, you and I can't even say we are believers, that Jesus is our Lord, unless the Holy Spirit is there to give us the words and the power to do so. God is moving first, even in those early days of becoming a Christian. Well, how does this work? Well, in the original language, this term advocate that Jesus uses here and other translations in English say counselor. It's really hard to translate, but the original Greek is the word paraclete, like a pair of soccer cleats. That's how I had to memorize it in my Greek one class back in the day. But this paraclete's an interesting term. It means to be called alongside of. It'd be like a, a person, who, a king who needed to make a decision, but all the details are overwhelming, so he brings in an advisor, a, a paraclete, who comes along beside, who helps him to navigate the complexity of that moment. Which brings me back to that long ro marathon road that I was in the middle of, wondering how I was going to reach the finish. By mile 23, I wanted to give up. In fact, I began to feel embarrassed how long it was taking me. I was taking longer walk breaks. I was saying things under my breath that I regret, but it's, you know, confession is good for the soul. Um, but it was about that time that I wanted to give up that my father-in-law, Mark, came along beside us. And Mark was the perfect guide for this moment because in his running career, he qualified and completed 10 marathons. He even qualified and ran the Boston Marathon, which not every runner gets to do that. And so as he was coaching us along the way, I felt more and more motivated. But let me be honest, when I got to mile 23, 24, I wanted to give up and I was taking this long walk break and Brian and Mark were about 20 to 30 feet in front of me and Mark turned around to give me a word of encouragement and the next words that were gonna come out of his mouth were gonna make or break whether I was gonna continue on or not. Like if he was gonna be really trite, if he was gonna say, Joe, the joy of the Lord is your strength, I would have said, you know what, you can take your Bible verse and go jump in the lake, okay? Like that would have not have been encouraging in that moment. If he would have turned around and been harsh to me and saying, you sign up for this marathon, you're not even going to complete it. If you would have said something like that, I would have said, you know what? I'm going to live my own life. You can live your own life. He turned around and he said, Joe, what are you doing back there? And for whatever reason, it was the word that I needed in the moment. And it helped me continue on forward and get closer and closer to the end. And through his gentle words of encouragement as he came to run alongside I was able to complete my first full marathon if, it w if he wasn't there to help God me I never would have made it and that's what the Holy Spirit does for you and for me if you and I are open to it you might be saying like that, you're like saying Joe I, that's that's the encouragement that I need I am in over my head here how do I begin to even understand how the Spirit is speaking to me it's at this point that I want to state this. I think that, that Rich Point Church is uniquely positioned to be a guide for you. Um, sometimes churches present themselves as the hero of the story, but I believe it's not the posture of the leaders of Ridge Point to be the hero of your story. It's your story. It's not our story. All we're inviting you to consider is to allow us to be the guy that joins you along the path as you go in your faith journey. And if I could boil down what it means for Ridgepoint to be a guide, I would say this, that Ridgepoint as a guide will help you follow Jesus like you mean it. And this is what I mean. Modern church has an interesting situation on our hands. 
Far too often we've conveyed that all the Christian story is about is for you and for me to consider what happens after we die. That's a piece of the story. But as we get in touch with the teachings of Jesus, we realize that there's a whole lot more going on in the Christian life than just waiting around till I pass away. Jesus had way more to say about what happens before then than the things that he said after we get into our post-mortem experience. And so along the way, American Christians are like, okay, there's more to this story. Now it's time for me to follow Jesus like I mean it. It's like going to work every single day and, and doing the adequate work. And so you sit down with your supervisor and the grade that they give you at the end of the evaluation is that you meet expectation. But they say to you, I want you to exceed expectation. And your job doesn't change. But you show up the next day and you begin to work with a more fervor like you mean it. Like you want to contribute more deeply to the cause of your organization. That happens at several moments in the long lifetime of the Christian believer. And so what I feel like at Rich Point Church, what we're uniquely positioned to do is to come alongside you and to invite you to consider Jesus as your Lord and Savior, but not just leave you there, but to continue to help you to move forward and, and further and deeper into the ways of grace. Because if you were to do so, I think you reach the end of the Christian life, which is to follow Jesus like it's your second nature that you don't have to force yourself to do Christian things. I don't have to force myself to do Christian things, but we follow Jesus as commonly and as effortlessly like the air that we breathe. From the very beginning of our story up to the current day, as we probe the mysteries of Christianity, why we gather as churches and why we do this thing week after week and day after day and morning after morning, it's because the ultimate goal of our life is to follow Jesus like it's our second nature. Have you ever witnessed somebody who does something very challenging, but they do it so effortlessly? Like someone who can make a three-pointer, like Steph Curry, he, like he shoots a three-pointer and he, like he turns around and he knows he's going to make it. He starts to jog back up the floor. Or you ever see like a video of a kid who can solve a Rubik's Cube in like 10 seconds? with one hand and it's like behind his back and he's like checking Twitter at the same time. Like obviously you're not born that way. You had to start somewhere and it was clumsy at the beginning. But in that awkward and clumsy beginning, you said, I want to get better at this. I want to make sacrifices in order to do so. I want to do whatever it takes to get there. The Christian faith is the same way. The moment we say yes to Jesus, we don't have it all together. We are in over our heads, and we do need a guide. And it's my hope this morning that as we sift through our lives, we would say that the highest aim of my life is to follow Jesus like I mean it, and to become like him, like it's my second nature. That's what I want to give myself to. Well, if that's what you'd like to do this morning, that, that process begins with a confession that we need someone to guide us and that we're in over our heads, which I think is a lovely way to come to the communion table this morning. Because when you and I take communion, we understand that we're in God's debt, that he's not in our debt, that we need him. Communion is not a meal for those who are prideful. You, don't come, you and I don't come to the communion table because we have it all together. We come to the communion table because we say, Lord, I need you. And in the formal language of communion is called the Eucharist, which is the Thanksgiving meal. It's like saying gracias in Spanish. The only way, the only reason why we say thank you is because we know that we received a gift that we couldn't get ourselves. So as we come to the communion table this morning during this next worship song, and as we go back to our chairs and as we take communion, I pray that you and I would have a conversation with God. And we say, God, help me in this moment, I need your guidance. I'm in over my head. How can I take my next faithful step? How can I move forward in my journey of following you like I mean it so that I can ultimately live as if following you is like my second nature? So I'm gonna pray for us in a moment and during this next song as the band plays and as we worship, I invite you to come to one of these tables 
that we have in the room and to take communion back and take communion after you have your time with God. And then after it's over, we'll have some closing remarks as we close worship. So let me pray for us and then we'll move into a time of communion and worship this morning. God, we thank you that you have been so gracious to us. And we thank you for this Thanksgiving meal. We were going without. We confessed that we were destitute, but you came and you rescued us. So as we come to this table and as we hold elements that remind us of the body that was broken for us and the blood that was poured out for us, which achieved our salvation, I pray that goodness and mercy would pass through our hearts, would reform our minds, would allow us to fall deeper in love with you, Jesus. God, we understand that this is a part of a conversation with you, that at this meal we confess that we need you. So we pray that you would hear us, that you would speak to us, and that you would change our lives. I ask all these things in the name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. I invite you to stand at this time as we worship, and whenever you see fit, to move to the communion tables and to receive the Lord's Supper together.
things as we dismiss this morning. The first thing is one of the supplements of our sermon series, the Writing Your Story, is we're giving these cards on the way out just as question prompts to examine your life and my life as we're writing our story. So we encourage you to take week two at the doors. Week one, if you missed it last week, is at the the back wall in the upper lobby area. So make sure you take those home and spend some time with God in those. If you're in our online audience, you can get those cards online if you go to ridgepointwichita.com slash story so that you can allow that to guide your thinking and my thinking as we meet with God through all this. Speaking of the sermon series, starting this Wednesday after family dinner hour, we're gonna start a new class gathering called Something More from the Sermon. If you've ever prepared a presentation, you know that you can't share everything, that so much is on the the cutting room floor before it gets to the final product. So if you'd like to engage in a further conversation about what we're preaching on, I will be there right after family dinner at 645 in the fireside room. We'll engage in questions, further study, some rebuttal, and some way to practice the things that we're preaching. So we encourage you to make your way there this Wednesday and we'll begin our journey together. Hey, thanks for being here. May the peace of Christ go with you as you go. You are dismissed. We'll see you later. Thanks again for joining us today. 
We want to give a special thanks to those of you who are relatively new to Ridgepoint, or maybe you're checking us out for the very first time. We're so glad and honored to have you with us today. We understand attending a new church can be a big challenge. Walking into a big building full of people you don't know is hard enough, but then you probably have questions with things like, what do I do with my kids? Or how do I join a group? Or very important things like, where do I find the bathrooms? We totally get all of that and we'd love to help you take the next step whenever you're ready. A great place to start is to just send us a text. Text the word RIDGE to the number 97000. Right away, you'll get a link where you can tell us more about what would be the most helpful to you. You can also reply with any questions you might have or prayer requests you'd like to share, and someone from our staff will get back to you just as soon as we can. Another great way to learn more or start getting plugged in is to subscribe to our email newsletters. We send an all-church email out every Thursday afternoon with the latest news and info about all of our upcoming events. We also have separate newsletters for parents of kids and students, as well as lists for our women's and men's ministry and updates from our prayer and mission teams. Sign up for any of these by visiting ridgepointwichita.com slash subscribe. Again, we're so grateful that you joined us today. Remember to send us that text if there's anything that we can do for you, and we hope to see you next time right here at Ridgepoint.